Hi everyone, I'm Vedant from Northeastern. I'm going to share the factors that inform adoption of AI for worker well-being. So work has a significant role to play in our mental health. According to the US Surgeon General, today we have an unprecedented opportunity to actually explore ways to help workers thrive. And this is primarily because uh, work is one of the, the uh, leading uh, sources of, of mental health challenges and uh, many workers are actually seeking employers based on uh, how their mental health is going to be taken care of. So why should an organization start caring for these workers then? Shouldn't work, workers just be understood based on their workload? Well, firstly, organizations lose money and they also lose talent. Recent trends show us that workers will move to organizations that care more about their well-being and workers who are not being taken care of, the organizations actually end up spending a lot more in just trying to keep up with their well-being needs. So certain companies have started adopting better principles. They've appointed dedicated officers. They've, in, in, uh, they've introduced different kinds of um, policies such as well-being leaves and uh, even introduced digital well-being support tools. But the question is, how do we get these tools to the people who need it the most? So when it comes to these kinds of data-driven decisions and identifying the right individuals, for example, worker management have typically relied on surveys. But even though these surveys are validated, they do suffer from some limitations. Surveys are typically measuring predispositions, they're not measuring behaviors. So what they measure tends to be hard to change. These surveys are also burdensome to deploy, so we can't get timely, regular insights. And lastly, because these workers rely, uh, these the surveys rely on self reports from the workers, they can't really capture the complex social dynamics in a workplace setting. And this is why we look towards a methodological approach known as passive sensing. It's the idea to automatically and unobtrusively record human activity with low to negligible effort. And with further advancements in computational power, we can now build many different kinds of sensors. In fact, in a worker's life, they're surrounded by sensors today. And the technology around them gives us an opportunity to understand their behaviors. These technologies include smartphones and wearables, which a worker owns, but it can also be technologies which are embedded in their work environment, uh, such as a Bluetooth beacon, or a social media app, which is a part of the digital environment. So following this idea of passive sensing, in the last five years or so, we have witnessed many large scale academic efforts to build better sensing approaches for worker well-being. Essentially, the idea is these sensors will be able to complement existing methods and we will be able to find new explanations about worker experiences and understand what makes a thriving worker. But what's important here to note is that these tools that we're talking about go beyond just recording daily activities. We're actually algorithmically interpreting that information. That makes it very different from a stopwatch, for example. So that is why throughout the, the, our paper, we refer to these technologies as passive sensing enabled AI or SI. Because passive sensing is being leveraged to power machine learning models, which are then making predictions what's the benefit of these so firstly these kinds of tools can actually capture many different ecological and dynamic aspects of work arguably this approach is not vulnerable to the same biases that we would expect a survey to be limited by and uh, lastly the behavioral nature of the data it can provide actionable insights for workers to change so essentially you can think of it as the the aim to be to build a fitbit for the workplace. But that's not exactly what happens in a work context. Psi for work is very different from how you would imagine Psi in your personal use. Workplaces have power inequities between the worker and the employers, and someone else having a lot more information about a worker can cost a worker their livelihood. And this makes the incentives of sharing the data to technology like Psi quite unclear compared to sharing your data with your Fitbit and then getting the information yourself. Yet many workers will be subject to Psi in the future and that will just worsen the asymmetry. So we need to figure out how can Psi work for workers and not the other way around.
So our key aim in this study is to disentangle the monolithic depiction of Psi and actually identify which aspects of it uh, make it more useful and uh, which aspects actually make it harmful. So for this, we conducted an experimental vignette study. Here in our case, uh, each Psi system uh, or each variation of the Psi system can be considered a policy. And uh, what we're really trying to do is we are trying to break that policy down into a variety of factors and analyze uh, the unique combinations of those factors. So what we know about technology in general is it tends to get accepted when the effort to use it reduces. And typically when it comes to sensing-based technologies, the assumption has always been that there will be higher adoption because it requires low to negligible effort. In fact, over the years, we have also seen movements like quantify itself pop up, uh, especially with more and more social and ubiquitous technologies becoming available. We see workers, um, and not, uh, not just workers actually, we see all sorts of individuals uh, becoming more willing to quantify aspects of their life. However, there are certain costs to doing this. For example, the more privacy aware we become uh, and the understanding we have of potential data loss and what that information can do to us, that creates a challenge to the adoption. So based on this understanding, we wanted to devise a few different hypotheses which will explain our factors for Psi. And we decided to come up with four aspects of technology itself. So first is the type of sensing. The next is the scope of that sensing. Then, the, and that was about how the data is collected. The next is once the data is interpreted, what kind of insight are we giving, right? Um, and uh, lastly, how, where does that insight go to further in the ecosystem of the worker? Um, and based on that, we wanna understand how it affects the perceived harm uh, as well as the perceived usefulness. And ultimately, how did that lead to willingness to adopt the technology? So when the exercise starts, each participant sees the same baseline and it's a combination, uh, the, the vignette is represented as a combination of text and icons. So as you can see over here, the, there's a textual description, but along with the textual description are these uh, graphical icons. And what a worker needs to do is they need to report how uh, useful they think this particular uh, technology could be for them, uh, how harmful it could be, and uh, would they be willing to actually use it. So these graphical icons serve actually two purposes. The first one is that it improves the recognizability of the vignettes. Um, and the next part is that it actually helps the participants learn more about that vignette by clicking into the icons. For example, once you click onto one of these icons, you can actually see what is going on. Uh, for instance, by clicking the uh, features, we understand what the technology, this particular side technology will uh, collect and what it will not collect. So, so to test our hypothesis, we used these linear mixed effects models and the variables we were interested in were these four categorical variables for each of the hypotheses. Uh, but we did control for a variety of things, for instance, the explanations, uh, the different demographic aspects of the participants, uh, job related characteristics, as well as their attitudes towards self-tracking, surveillance, privacy, and trust. Every side technology needs to begin with some kind of input. So in comparison to using just visually recorded facial data, that's what the baseline was, which was the webcam, we found that physical activity as well as digital time use were considered to be significantly more useful um, as well, well as significantly less harmful uh, than the other kinds of uh, approaches of taking the input data. However, what we did find is that online language was something that workers were not particularly excited about. Interestingly enough, we did not find a significant difference between the work context and the and sensing in a more broader non-work context as well. So we decided to do one more post hoc analysis where we look at the interaction effect between the scope of sensing and the types of sensing we just saw. Um, and this is when we find something interesting. So if you notice the graphs, the red bars represent the perceptions in general context, and the blue bars represent the perception for the work context. As you can see, work and general scoping score quite similarly for digital time use as well as physical activity. The bars are pretty close. However, if you look at online language specifically, either for perceived harm or for perceived use, there's a pretty big gap. 
so specifically online language in the general scope is as harmful if not more harmful than what people perceived for the webcam and the general scope uh, vignettes were about extracting language from personal social media instead work related social media was something that might actually provide an opportunity to for adoption so the implications from these first two uh, hypotheses are pretty straightforward we need to train models on data from approved context and in cases like online language we need to find a way to highlight the utility without worsening the harms by finding the appropriate overlapping context now let's move on to the other hypothesis so the next thing which was a pretty straightforward one which is what kind of insight would they prefer what's the output they want to see from sci now while workers are typically seen as people who have to produce and perform what was interesting is that getting insights on mental well-being was something which workers were a lot more willing to adopt than getting insights for their performance not only did they think that performance based insights were, could be potentially more harmful they also thought that it was less useful and that might be because workers often feel that they have other ways to get the signal of their performance now let's look at what other stakeholders can do when they're included in the system so what our results show is that keeping insights private just to the individual that is definitely perceived to be far more favorable um, than other kinds of sharing for example sharing with the supervisor uh, sharing with the supervisor was our baseline condition because most workplaces tend to deploy these technologies in tandem with a, a flow automatically going to the supervisor uh, but what was also interesting is that workers were somewhat willing to adopt technologies where it was also further shared as an anonymous aggregate and they perceived this to be both less harmful um, and more useful than sharing this same insight to other individuals and that individual could not only be their supervisor but even uh, co-workers trusted co-workers were also not something which workers are very excited about so the preference for mental well-being insights uh, was interesting because on one hand workers want better understandings but on the other hand there's a history of tensions in discussing health at work so looking at everything collectively what we're seeing is that workers know their activities quite well and they would want to learn a lot more about their mental health and the lower willingness towards sharing the data with individuals actually indicates that maybe we don't want to set up automatic channels and just give workers more agency to decide when they want to share their data for collective sense making and um, another interesting thing that we also did is we included a table of all the vignettes that we had and um, we in the main paper we actually have this graph that um, tries to just chart out uh, which vignettes were considered acceptable and which ones are not so the graph you, the ones that are marked as plus signs um, those are the ones that were considered to be acceptable and as you can see there's a very small landing zone to make these technologies um, actually adoptable so if you go at this blind in all likelihood you're going to fail only 10 out of 49 vignettes were considered acceptable now to conclude even if we were able to make a perfectly accurate psi technology we need to build these prototypes in a way that they're actually helping and facing the workers directly so here's a uh, particular image that uh, is a figure from a, a prior chi paper that we had and uh, what we're really showing over here is we are showing aggregate data of uh, an organization and we are splitting the organization into multiple different cohorts um, and this is a way for workers to understand which uh, what what the what culture uh, exists in in their organization and uh, this is uh, essentially we are sharing using online language in a work only context to get a sense of mental well-being related dimensions because culture affects mental well-being and we are sharing it in an aggregate way this is a way for us to now think that we need to do more of this kind of work where the insights from sire are worker facing their worker first and their worker flexible uh, so with that i conclude my talk and um, 
for more information please read our paper and if you have any questions do drop me a mail uh, i want to thank my co-authors for all their effort in making this paper possible and thank you so much for listening